I thought of this uh, really cool name, Remote Control WordPress, and I was trying to envision in my head what I could do to kind of visually show that. And uh, I thought like a really cool race car with like a WordPress logo on the front would be cool. I started to look at stock car and I was like, I'm not going to buy that. I'm not going to pay money for that. So, so um, but the idea is that, yeah, so I, I wanted to, to find a way to, to use WPCLI and do a little bit more automation. And here's what we're going to talk about today. Come on in. So I'll give you a slight introduction about what it is that I'm talking about so that this kind of makes a little bit more sense. Uh, there is a lot of information, so if there's something that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, just stop me and say, actually, can you help me understand? Uh, so really, the talk is based around WPCLI, uh, local development, uh, using WordPress to uh, have a remote connection into uh, um, actually a, another server so that you can execute commands. Um, so using these aliases, which make it easier to, to have a, a remote connection, I'll look at some database commands, and we'll, we'll finally get uh, a bunch of scripts together and uh, look at the complete script that actually does something functional. Uh, so my name is Edmund, as you guys know. I work at WP Engine. It's a digital experience platform for WordPress. So we have uh, lots of um, different ways to, to host WordPress, whether it's shared or it's dedicated or enterprise. Um, so different uh, configurations. I, I normally have a slide here that shows this is who I am, this is what I do. I figured I'd take it one step further and actually go into pictures, because that's, that's more visual. Uh, so this is uh, something I really like is cycling, and uh, we took a trip to Amsterdam. Uh, this is uh, the WP Engine London office, um, and uh, what, what we were actually what we realized after this picture was uh, taken, the uh, the woman who took the picture was laughing at us because this animal is apparently not so friendly. <laughs> so. Um, I love snowboarding, so this is a picture of me uh, at, in the Alps, and I also love music production, so anytime I get, I will be in the studio uh, making some sorts of sounds. And when I'm not doing all that, I'm with these guys, these are my kids. They're going really fast on their Vespas, as you can tell. <laughs> all right, so, uh, so yeah, so a, a sales engineer is really somebody who has to find solutions. So I look and, and see, uh, a problem and I have to find a way to overcome that, that and uh, really define what, what the solution is and then find a way to get there. And a lot of times that means thinking creatively and by that I mean it's maybe not, the solution may not be within the application or it may not be within the platform that I'm using. So there are times when I'll have to say, actually, I can't do that with this platform at all, and I have to look at something else, whether it's a third party or it's, a, it's something completely different. So the problem that I wanted to solve here was how do I take my database on a production website and copy it down to my local environment? Um, and it, it's, it's not a difficult problem to solve. There's many ways to do this, but I wanted to do this with WPCLI, and I wanted to do it in a way that was repeatable and, and something that I could really script out, do it once, and then run it on a, a regular basis. So the solution involves, of course, developing locally with WordPress, uh, creating aliases to access uh, a WordPress site remotely, uh, using SSH to connect to these remotes and also using uh, WPCLI commands to actually get the database and do some database uh, interactions. How many people here are developers? Okay, it's a good split. Um, and do you guys also work locally on your, your development or is it all on, on servers? It's a good, good amount. <clears throat> so, there's a couple of ways that you can work locally. Um, I've always, well, so I've actually done all of these. So, uh, 
And in the beginning, the, the easiest way to, to do development was with Map. That's kind of what made me say, actually, I can do this, because it was easy to install. It was an application. You install it, and you've got this whole server. Uh, you can use virtual machines. Docker containers are really popular now as well. Um, if you're a complete maverick, you could build a local server and risk your entire development environment changing as you update your OS. Uh, and, and actually, there's a lot of uh, solutions from a host now. So hosts are, are more commonly bringing a product that will do local development and actually bring the local environment up to their, uh, their hosting environment. Um, so I use VBB as my local development tool. And one of the reasons why I like it is because it has a lot more things than just, uh, just a development environment. So lots of different tools. So uses virtual machine, this virtual box as a virtual machine. So um, it essentially is a, uh, a completely different system running on my laptop. And it uses a tool called Vagrant for configuration. And that actually does some provisioning and automation. So one thing that, that really struck me when I looked at this slide is like, so VVB, does anyone know what it stands for? Yeah, it's on the slide. <laughs> <laughs> so very vagrant vagrants. But you've got VVB, you've got VirtualBox, you've got Vagrant. So I wonder if Mont is something, but we might never know. <laughs> so, um, yeah, VirtualBox is a hypervisor. So essentially, it's a it's a virtual machine manager. It uh, it takes a slice of your computer and it says I can actually run another system completely on there. So you have the concept that so this laptop is my host and then a virtual machine that runs there would be a guest machine. Um, you can have multiple machines. So it's not just one. Uh, I can have multiple operating systems. It could be. Windows, Windows, Linux, Mac. It can be something that's configured, so you can get a distribution that's an operating system or something that's, that's very specific to an application. And you're also able to save state. So you can terminate it, you can stop it, you can save it, reboot when you're not using it. So fairly, uh, fa fairly easy to, to go back to where you started, which, which can be really, really uh, interesting and useful. So the, the hypervisor looks somewhat like this. So if you imagine this is the operating system that you're running on, and the hypervisor is a layer, a thin layer on top that does all of the allocation for memory and resources for virtual instances. So on top of that hypervisor, we can have these guest virtual machines. And that's really what is, what. Um, what VVB is doing, so I've got my Mac OS and it runs Ubuntu on top of that. So Vagrant comes in as a tool that actually automates and builds out the system to our specifications. So in the case of VVB, it's actually doing some installation. Uh, it uses a, uh, a base box, so it's got a virtual machine that it starts with and then it, it installs and configures on top of that. So it does things to the virtual machine as well as the local machine in order to make that work. Um, WPCLI, of course, a command line tool, allows you to do things in WordPress that you would have to actually click around for. You'd have to go into dashboard and actually do operations with a mouse. So uh, allows you to also automate things that are repetitive. So if you want to do something over and over again, you just have to have a script that does that. You can loop through a script, and in that you can bundle commands together, and you can save them, run them at any time. And the base of the system is Bash. So I don't think that we really talk too much about Bash. It's something that, as a developer, I've used a little bit. And it's been kind of like a utility. But I never would say that I'm a Bash expert. And I think it's a, it's a tool. Um, but it is, uh, it's really interesting to learn. You can do a lot more with it than I probably do. Um, really, it's a shell scripting language. Um, 
it's almost 30 years old, so it, it's, it's really common. You'll find that on uh, you know, lots of different systems. It can read command from me typing into a terminal, or can actually read a command from a file, and that's where we get into our scripting. Uh, and then there is uh, there, there's some simple things that you can do, but there's also con control structures, so you can do if-then statements and variables. Lots more, but for the scope of this presentation, we'll keep it to those two. Uh, and you know, throughout the presentation, you'll see links here, so I've always tried to cite information if you want to learn more about it. Um, so I said BBV is great because it's got a lot of stuff, and this is some of the stuff that it has. Uh, so it does the server, it, it installs the local server, it has a database with PHP my admin for management, and also some other tools, including WP CLI. So this is a really great starting point for development. I don't have to really go and install other things. Configuration is, is almost finished for me. You can add uh, additional WordPress sites quite easily. Um, and so this all runs on top of Ubuntu. There, this is uh, the, the virtual machine. This is the base box that, uh, that's, that's used by VBB uh, uh, and provisioned to, to, be, uh, to have all of the software on it. So, SSH and <coughs> configuration. Um, because we have this virtual machine, it's essentially another system running on my laptop. So there's no way for me to actually access it without using a remote connection. Uh, it sounds kind of strange that you'd have to remote into something that's it's literally running on the same system, but they're almost entirely separate. Uh, so that's where SSH comes in. So you'll have to use that to get a remote connection to run any shell scripts or any sort of commands using WPCLI. Um, so SSH it can be secured by public-private key authentication. So I've got a, a key that's on my local system, a, a private key which is matched to a public key which is on the remote system. The benefit is, so those keys are checked to make sure that they match. And the, the benefit is that the, the password is eliminated. So you won't have to enter a password, which is really handy for scripting. So this can be just run by an automated process if you need to connect and run a script. Um, so it looks something like this. So this is to illustrate that you've got this client private key and a remote public key that gets checked and some additional information there if you want to dig deeper. Um, runs on, SSH runs on port 22, and a typical SSH command would be to use SSH, the username, at hostname. Uh, once you run that, um, you can add options to the end, and usually what I would do is point <coughs> to the location of my private key. So that dash I option would be at the end of this command, and sometimes if you're connecting to a remote for the first time, you'll get a message that says, do you want to add this key to a list of hosts? And you say yes, and that never happens again. And actually saves to your known hosts file, and it will make it uh, easier to connect to in the future. So I've given an example of a basic configuration file. So we can make it easier to connect to SSH by using a configuration file. And what I would typically do is take the host name, username, and then the path to the, the private key. This is, this is probably the, the minimum that you would need to, to actually set this up. But whatever I use as your name, so let's say I called it Edmund, I would just say SSH Edmund, and that would go directly to, that would connect direct, directly to the remote server. Um, so as part of that configuration of what VDD does, uh, it uses Vagrant. Vagrant has a whole set of commands. And Vagrant has an SSH configuration command, which will actually just generate this. Simple. You don't have to mess around with anything. I would always maybe change the, the host to something that makes sense. So again, I would, I would go host admin or production or dev, whatever you're, you're using it for. And then I take this and copy it into my SSH configuration file. So uh, this is, is something that you can save 
in one place a, a group of different connections, um, and that makes it uh, much easier. One thing to note, and I know this is potentially hard to see, but this port can change. So it is very possible, and I've spent a, a bunch of time trying to figure out why my connections didn't work when I, I would terminate and then re reboot the virtual machine and the port changes. So that's, that's what I found. Hopefully that saves some time for all of you. Um, cool. How many people are using WPC Live? All right. Yes. You're in the right place. <laughs> uh, uh, what about aliases? Yes. Okay. Cool. Um, so, typical command line interface. Uh, you essentially just entering your commands here on uh, on the the, uh, the command line. Um, it's not very beautiful, and a lot of people will be scared of this. But they're just words. We can all read through them. It's it's not really too difficult if you take some time to to just focus on it. Um, so I think the aliases are, you know, just judging from uh, count of hands, there's, there's only a few of you who actually have used them. Um, it's a little known feature, and it's, it's something that is pretty simple to set up, which could save you a lot of time. Um, it's essentially just setting a shortcut to a server. So I don't have to go through that whole SSH connection to do something. I can just specify that I want to run a command on a remote. Um, it works with a, a very small configuration file. It's a YAML file. Um, and one of the cool things is you can actually group together these remotes. So if you imagine, instead of running a command in the, the terminal on one WordPress instance, I could run it on many instances. I'll show you how that works because I think that's, that's really cool. Um, so you can set aliases globally, or they can be on a site-by-site -site basis. So it could be at the server level, or it could be literally for each site that has different aliases. And that makes a lot of sense, because you probably would have different uh, production for, for each site. Uh, yeah, and then you know, clearly the, the benefit is time saved. So I don't have to really log in, uh, sorry, connect with uh, SSH, uh, change directories, run a command, then exit, and then do whatever else I was going to do. Um, so these remotes, they, they, they get set up with aliases to look like this. So this would be my production site. I've got the SSH connection that we specified in the SSH config. And I've got the um, path here for my dev environment. Uh, and that's something that uh, you'll need for VBB. Um, and grouping the aliases together, very simply, it can be done like that. And if I ran a command on both, that would actually run on both. Amazing. Um, simple commands, this is how you would use an alias so that the normal command, the, the structure for WPCLI is WP command and subcommand. So in this case, we're doing the at dev um, alias, and that will run that command on the dev server. So I'd usually have this BBB and then production. You might get totally different results depending on, on what's installed there. Um, so as this problem that we're trying to solve involves database commands, we'll talk about a couple of database commands. But actually, not too many. <clears throat> One of the really important things to know is that you can always get help. So the help command takes a subcommand and will give you a nice display of all the things that you can actually do with that uh, WPCLI command. Uh, and for DB, there's a couple of really useful things. You can optimize. You can uh, look at the tables, prefix, actually use some repairs. Uh, but in this case, we're going to look at export and import. All right. So let's take a, a bunch of commands and tie them all together. So I've started to take WPCLI and mix it with a bit of shell scripting. And this is not going to be too involved, but the, the idea here is that you can add some logic into your WPCLI commands. So in this case, I'm going to my production server. I'm looking to see if Hello Dolly is installed. So it's plugin is installed, hello. 
bash has a variable, uh, this question mark variable. And essentially what that does is it will give me the value for the last command, right? And in this case, uh, we want to check if the plugin is installed. And if it's not installed, go ahead, install it. So all this is doing here, it's, it's quite simply an if-then statement. So if, it, if the uh, result is not equal to zero, then install the plugin. Because everyone wants to install Hello Dali, right? Uh, and then, uh, so what I've done is just to take the comments out, just reduce it, show that it's it's really simple and clear. And actually, for any Bash script, you're going to need this thing at the top called the shebang. It's it's really just tells where this this uh, file should be run, what application should run it. Um, so. We talked about variables and control structures. I think you've seen the if-thens. The variables can be created very simply. So I just say name equals Edmund, uh, give it a, a string, and then there's an echo command, which actually will print that variable out to screen. So echo name <coughs> would print out Edmund. So it gets deeper. We can take the output of a command and save it as a variable as well. So I put the command in these brackets, and I'm actually just saving the blog name as blog name. And then again, echoing it, and then printing out the blog name. So in our case, I'll need to get the site URL from production, and I'll need to replace that with the dev site URL. So I use option get site URL and save that into a variable for both production and development. So this is really the, the coolest part, I think. And it took a little while for me to figure this out, even though it's, it's pretty straightforward. I'm going into production. I'm exporting the database. But the other stuff is a little bit tricky. So that, that hyphen, it actually takes the, the entire database, the SQL dump, and prints it out to the screen, which doesn't really help you that much at all. It's going to be a long running screen of SQL statements. Uh, the greater than symbol actually takes that output and redirects it to a file. And it's, it's not a file on this production environment, since I'm actually running it from a different uh, system. It's going to save it locally where I ran the command. I mean, that's brilliant. So I don't have to go and download the file and then process it or do you know, whatever else. It's there already. So. My next step is to actually import that into my dev environment. And very straightforward, so I'm doing dev db import, and I'm giving it the path to the file. Uh, there's a, a search and replace function. This is, is actually a totally different thing. This is not part of the, the, the database uh, command, but that's essentially what it does. It will search for one string and replace with the other. So I've got my production site URL, replacing it with the dev site URL. And what would, what would coding be without some housekeeping? So we, uh, we take the file that we downloaded and remove it. Just simply the rm command, get rid of it. Uh, last step. So in order to run a script, we need to make it executable. And in this case, we'll use a, a command called schmod. And that essentially will go and uh, add this uh, um, executable permission to our file. So we, our getdb.shell file will actually be able to be executed by typing dot slash getdb. So I put that all together for you guys. It is. Here, this is what it looks like in its form, just a couple of lines that can be run to take your production database and move it to development. Um, 
this could be done maybe weekly. I, I, I don't know what best practices are for you guys. I would say probably weekly makes a lot of sense because things can change on, uh, you know, assuming that all of the work is being done on a staging server or another server and then pushed to production. So you want to get the most current version of your production content. I'll save that here on uh, GitHub as well, so you can take a look, uh, download that. Um, and in conclusion, so you can use aliases in WPCLI uh, with VVV. It makes for a really great system. I, I think that it is pretty straightforward and can make things a lot quicker. And scripting can make things uh, repeatable and make life a little bit easier by you to do things quickly uh, with some pre uh, pre planning, of course. Um, I've just put a blog post on Torque Magazine. So it is a two part series about what I've talked about today. The first part is live, and this is talking about aliases. The second part goes into the script with the, the database export, which I talked about. That will be live tomorrow ish. Um, and I've also added some links, some reference. Uh, essentially, uh, yeah, you know, there's a lot, lot of information here, so if you want to learn more about SSH, that's here. I've added a, an alternative to, uh, you know, maybe you don't want to use WPCLI for this at all, because it actually is a, a process that other things will do, so WP Migrate is available. You can do this in a plugin. That'd be a lot simpler. Um, there's a reference for WPCLI commands. I've li linked to a script tutorial, so if you want to learn further about bash scripting, you can go in and do that there. And also, you know, of course, you don't have to use BBB. You can use another approach. Maybe forward-looking would be to, to check out uh, WP Local Docker. Um, so that's that's really what I came here to talk about. I hope you guys enjoyed it, and I've got some slides available on SlideShare, and you can reach out. Um, you can get me at uh, edmund.turbin at uh, wpengine.com and on Twitter at Spice Cadet. Okay. You're getting a master class today in this track, I have to say. <laughs> Any questions, Fred? <coughs> yes. As well as capturing the whole database. Yep. Um, what about have you tried auto capturing the associated files? It would be the whole, the whole thing, the whole uh, WordPress instance. So copying the the files as well. I would uh, I would do it in a different way. Yeah. So I, I would um, I would <laughs> probably be using GitHub or or a Git repository, and I would sync that way. So just deploy the changes to to both. Yeah. When you call down from production to, to the staging or development, um, are you concerned about any like private data, like users' data, that's inside the production database that might come down with it? Depends. Yeah, yeah. And then there's definitely so in the case of like WooCommerce, if you're taking transactions, mm. yeah. So do you only like clean up before you put it on. I haven't had to, but I imagine that you would want to if it was sensitive information. Um, yeah, and so some people will, will not want to use production in, in a staging environment, so it's perfectly valid. I've done much smaller stuff then. Yeah. I was going to ask, around that, can you be selective about what tables you ignore when you do the export? I bet you could, yeah. So I, I think you could export and exclude certain tables, okay. yeah. So, and, and there's, you know, you can use, you know, you can write custom queries and do that with WPCLI, so. Um, and then, you know, there's other tools that will allow you to select. So I, I know for WP Engine, there's a way to use our legacy staging, which will allow you to get certain tables and not mm -hmm. other ones. So, but, but that doesn't really help you to get it to the local environment. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you pass commands in with uh, WPCLI, or <coughs> if, you, if, you do, if you do it fairly often enough, you can use your YAML files to specify what tables to, mm -hmm. to look into and what. Anybody else? Good. Well, thank you again. All right.